Okay. So welcome everyone. My name is Mary Pinella. I'm a graduate admissions officer here at Johnson & Wales University. I want to welcome you to the virtual information session for the Master of Science in Counseling program here at Johnson & Wales University. Um, today we're joined by two of our faculty members and I'll hand the mic over to them to let them introduce themselves and kick us off in our discussion of the counseling field and the Master of Science program. Okay, thank you, Mary. And I'm another Mary. Uh, I'm Professor Dias, and um, I was part of the, um, the development of this particular program. So it's difficult for me to be objective because it's, it's been a labor of love to get to this point. Um, my area of specialization is grief and loss associated with either finite or non-finite loss and also trauma. Um, I consistently teach the advanced individual uh, counseling techniques course, career counseling, uh, group counseling, and I'll be teaching lifespan development um, for the new cohort, if in fact you're interested and you were accepted. So welcome. And I'm Professor Smarinsky. Um, most of my clinical work is focused on trauma treatment and prevention, working with ch children and adolescents, uh, but also working with adults and court mandated folks. Um, I'm a recent addition to uh, JWU, and um, yeah, welcome. So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, employment of substance abuse, behavioral disorder, and mental health counselors is projected to grow 25% between 2019 and 2029. So it looks like there's a pretty good uh, career outlook for the field of counseling. Um, I was wondering if Mary and Evan, if you can talk to the specific uh, concentration fields within counseling and the settings in which people go into work within this field. Okay, I'll, I'll begin. Um, you know, these are these are staggering statistics. It's fortunate for any of us who are in the field, but it's very unfortunate for those who are seeking the services because there's not enough out there. Um, and as you can see, a 25% projected growth rate um, is pretty high, especially if you look at it in relationship to other fields. So um, you, you can use this master, well, it depends whether you go into the mental health um, track or the addictions track. And I understand that there is comorbidity. And so that if you're dealing with mental health, there may also be a substance abuse problem and vice versa. Um, but there are some specialized courses that we offer that are uh, for each tract. So um, I, I'm just gonna skip to addiction and substance abuse. I do a lot of pro bono work in an inpatient residential treatment program uh, for women. It's a 15 month uh, program and it's been very successful. And I do find um, a very strong correlation between addiction and uh, PTSD and child abuse. In fact, I'm doing a study on that right now. Um, so there are several agencies in the state of Rhode Island and residential treatment, either uh, part-time or uh, residential, as I said, full-time, uh, not enough, but um, certainly if that's something you're interested in, there are many people looking, many organizations and agencies looking for people with this kind of background. As I mentioned, um, grief um, with the pandemic, I've had, I have a private practice as well, and I'm finding a huge increase in the calls of people who are looking for some kind of, of grief assistance or support um, given the pandemic. Um, clinical, as I mentioned, I, I also have a private practice, so um, that's equally as busy. And um, a lot of our students do go into clinical facilities, um, as you can see, outpatient, as well as inpatient and residential facilities. Um, if you're familiar with Rhode Island, you know, the, the, big, the big names of the Providence Center, uh, Bradley Hospital, um, Hasbro Children's Hospital, 
uh, they're all looking for people with this kind of background uh, in addition to the people that they have on staff. And there are, uh, there's a lot of grant funded programs throughout the state. So um, maybe um, Evan, you wanna speak to rehab and uh, government nonprofit or school? Sure, so um, <clears throat> with a master's in, in either clinical or addiction substance use, um, you'll be able to work in a lot of different settings. I think one of the, the most exciting things about uh, pursuing a degree in a, a profession in counseling is uh, the number of places you can end up working. Um, and I think it, you're, you'll be able to work if you're wanting to do community-based in private practice or with a larger agency. If you're wanting to work in a school, that's also open to you. I've worked as a school-based uh, mental health counselor. Um, so yeah, I think if, if I was to offer what was one of the selling points of uh, pursuing a master's of counseling at uh, Johnson and Wales is that you'll have a lot of not only job stability, but a lot of different places you can go as far as settings and, and working with different populations. And I agree with you. Um, many students, when I ask them when they first start, where do you want to work and, and what, what do you want to do? They don't know. And I often ask them to start off, and I ask anyone listening to this, to start off asking yourself, what population kind of grabs your heart? You want to work with women, children? Do you want to work with abuse? Um, and once you determine the population, then that kind of helps you segue into the, the venue where you, would, where you would work in terms of gender and age and socioeconomic status. Rhode Island has a lot of at-risk residential schools that you could also work. So um, unfortunately, the sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and would either of you like to start off talking specifically about our program? Um, Ellen, you can take this one from the top. Okay. Um, so one of the nice things about the program is it allows you to pursue part-time option if you're looking for that. If you're entering the program and wanting to do it full-time, um, you'll be able to graduate quicker than a, with a lot of other programs. Um, I think one of the really cool things about the program is it utilizes a cohort model. So um, folks move through the program as kind of a group and that allows you to get support from your peers and um, really, I guess, just kind of work as a team and, and be able to, to develop and grow together. I think, I think that creates a lot of camaraderie and um, a good uh, culture of support and group. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so we do have two concentrations. Um, so you'll have, um, there's a, a fair amount of courses that you'll take that uh, will be specialized as either clinical mental health or addictions. Um, and then, yeah, so after you get through most of your coursework, you'll begin um, with practicum and in, into internship where you'll be actually working with clients. It's kind of where the rubber meets the road and, and you can put in uh, to practice all the academic sort of skills and knowledge that you've been learning through the program. Um, and as far as the last outcomes measures I saw for the program, um, really high job placement rates and it seems like folks are able to pass the NCE, the National um, Counselor Examination with ease. So folks that are graduating from the program are not only finding jobs easily, but also um, doing well as far as uh, um, licensure um, exams. So, so anything you'd like to add to that, Mary? Yeah. I'm, um... So I think the beauty of this program too is that it, there's a marriage of academics with experiential learning. And we do find, and the students will agree, that that hands-on experiential role play uh, is essential. And really in hindsight, once they're out in the field, we'll say that was that's where I learned the most was just doing it over and over again and being given some case studies or, or client um, profile that that very difficult and, and also all very different. So we do have a counseling lab 
which is has a one way mirror and video so you can videotape uh, yourselves doing one on one counseling uh, and or group counseling facilitating a group. And um, so you do learn these clinical skills. So you take the theoretical foundation, as the, the slide says, and you um, apply it to client interactions and interventions. Um, and as Evan just said, you're prepared to take the NCE before graduation, which is a distinct advantage before you're entering the job market, because a lot of people are not eligible to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So another thing or aspect I like about the program is it, it's the timing of classes when classes occur are easier for folks that are working and for it to fit in within their schedule. So um, a lot of my current students are either working part-time or full-time and are able to fit in um, or schedule around the classes because they're later in the day. Um, I like not having class on Friday. So it's a mm -hmm. Monday through Thursday schedule. I think everybody likes not having class on Friday. Um, if you're doing it full time, you're going to be taking three or four classes per semester. Typically in the summer, you might take three and in, in the fall and spring do four. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> some of our courses, most of our courses are face to face, but there are some that are done remotely. Um, Again, during your internship practicum, that's when you're going to be doing your field work experience. Um, and our program has three full-time faculty and, and four adjuncts. And I think one of the things I like about the other faculty or faculty members in this program is a diverse range of clinical experience and um, different perspectives. So I think you'll get a, a wide range of um, perspectives and, and clinical experience to, to, to learn from. And, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you don't get that in programs. So there's 12 core courses. Uh, I mentioned a few of them. Uh, there's a professional orientation, which is one of the first courses that you take. There's neuropsych and psychopathology. Um, I remember when designing this program, we not only spoke to the Department of Labor, but to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and also to um, practicing clinicians and ask them to go back into their memory of when they were in their graduate program. And was there one course that really helped them the most or something they really remember? Or was there a course that, they, that was never offered and they wish they had? And what we found overwhelmingly is that they identified a course in uh, psychopathology and, and neuro um, as something that they never had. And even though when you're out uh, as a clinician, whether you're in private practice or in a, um, a nonprofit or a profit-making organization, um, you're not obviously uh, providing medication, but you certainly should be aware of the side effects of the medications because oftentimes a client may come in and you might perceive that behavior, whether verbal or nonverbal, as being um, a, a behavioral health issue when in fact it's side effects of the medication. So I, I'm really glad that we put that course in. Um, in addition to what I just said, group counseling, and these are the program is uh, KCREP equivalent. So what that means is KCREP is the certifying body of graduate programs in counselor education. And so we know exactly what KCREP wants us to include. And so the courses that are offered are based on that. Um, as you can see, once you've decided whether you wanna do clinical mental health or addiction, you'll have electives that kind of split up your cohort just a little bit into those sections. And then you come back together in the core courses. You have 150 hours of practicum and you will have an internship. Um, the internship, you have to be under a licensed professional, 600 hours and you have to have this in order to apply for a license. Um, many of our students will continue on to full-time employment at the agency where they interned. So there's no better place, say if you went to BH Link, um, if you're not familiar with that, that is the, uh, actually broke ground uh, in terms of this kind of model. It's an emergency room only for behavioral health issues. So for those people who are experiencing anything associated with behavioral health, they're not being taken to a, a hospital ER and, and laying around for 12 hours. 
and no one's taking care of them. BH Link is directly um, associated with only those issues. They're open 24 seven, they have a hotline and they will come and pick people up if they need to get there. So um, I even have on my answering machine, if this is an emergency, call BH Link. I don't even say call 911 because a lot of the uh, EMTs will take you directly to a hospital. The reason I mentioned BH Link, not because it's such a novel uh, concept, is that we have so many students who are doing their internships there. Many have been hired as well. Oh, here we go. So the foundation courses, these are the courses that you will have all together. And as Evan mentioned, it's the cohort model. So you're with the same people from the first day, except if you kind of go off into those electives um, and then recoup again into the foundation courses. But you start together and you graduate together and you commiserate together. And um, it's really a very strong support system. So counseling of course, the lifespan is, is like an advanced developmental psych course with more application to counseling. Health and wellness, obviously we know um, the holistic approach that our field is going into. There's so much empirical evidence about um, the mind-body connection that oftentimes some of the things that we give our clients for homework are involved around health and wellness and nutrition. And this third is the course that I was just telling you about, the advanced neuroscience and psychopharmacology, where you learn about all of the meds, the side effects of the meds. And of course, given the technology today with PET scans, our field is embracing neuroscience because neuroscience is giving us the evidence-based information to support what we do. So if you decide to go into the mental health uh, track, you would take advanced individual mental health, which is what I teach, and then you'll take mental health counseling for families. If you go into the addiction elective, you'll take advanced co-occurring disorders and addictions counseling. And in addition, you will take counseling the chemically dependent and their families. So if you would like to apply for either the MS in clinical mental health or addiction counseling, um, you would need to complete the online graduate studies application. And that application can be found by visiting apply.jwu.edu and selecting the graduate studies application. We're currently reviewing applications for the spring semester, which is beginning on January 19th. We do have rolling admissions, so there's no deadline to apply. However, you'll want to apply with enough time for your application to be reviewed, your interview to be conducted, and for you to properly enroll in your courses ahead of the start of the semester. So I always recommend applying sooner rather than later to give yourself plenty of time. In order to apply for the program, you need to have either obtained a bachelor's degree or be in the process of completing your bachelor's degree. Um, so basically your degree needs to be conferred prior to the start of the program. We look for a minimum GPA of 2.85 and along with the online application form, you need to submit a personal statement and a resume. Um, the personal statement is generally an essay expressing your aptitude for graduate level studies and your interest in going into the field of counseling. Uh, we do have a specific questionnaire that we send out to each applicant um, to get some specific answers for you to um, write into your personal statement. So if you do apply to the program, I will personally email you that list of questionnaires. Um, if you have work or internship experience in the field of mental health, we do take that into consideration along with your academic work. Additionally, we require three letters of recommendation. So when you're filling out the online application, you'll input the names and email addresses of the individuals who will be providing your recommendations and they'll receive an email link from Johnson & Wales requesting that they upload the recommendations through a secure link. So that's sort of handled for you. And finally, an admissions interview with the counseling faculty is a requirement of the admissions process. So once your application has been reviewed by the admissions committee, I would be personally reaching out to you to schedule you for a virtual admissions interview with Mary and Evan. 
Uh, we do look for the following prerequisite courses for enrollment in the MS counseling programs. General psychology and abnormal psychology are the most crucial, um, particularly abnormal psychology, because a lot of the information that you learn in that course, um, such as diagnoses, how to use the um, uh, diagnostic manual, that information will be really useful to you as you take your first couple semesters of master's level courses. So we always encourage people to take abnormal psychology. Um, we also look for statistics or research methods, and this can be in the form of general statistics, business stats, psychology stats, or biostatistics. Um, or if you have a research methods course wherein statistics was utilized, we would accept that as well. And if for whatever reason you haven't taken either a specific research methods or statistics course, we will look at the other coursework on your transcript to determine if you've met the requirements elsewhere. So typically here we would take questions, um, but if we don't have any questions for right now, I'd like to thank our faculty, Dr. Mary Dias and Dr. Evan Smirinsky for joining us today and um, thank those of you who attended and we definitely hope to be hearing from you in the future. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out via the contact information on the screen and hopefully you'll be joining one of our upcoming cohorts in 2021. Thank you, Mary. Thank you all. Thank you.